Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. The beginning of the year is a time for reflecting on the past and plotting a better future. In Britain, the focus is on where Brexit is taking the nation. How will leaving the EU affect the UK's sense of itself and its international standing? Well, my guest is a distinguished political veteran, Lord Owen, David Owen, a former Labour Foreign Secretary who tried and failed to change the face of British politics by launching a new party on the centre-left. Does the UK currently have a clue where it's going? Lord Owen, welcome to Hard Talk. Nice to be here. Let's start with Brexit. This has to be, 2018 has to be the year a deal is done, an agreement reached between Britain and the EU27 on the shape of Brexit, because if it's not done this year, there won't be time to ratify it before 2019. Do you believe a deal can and will be done? It certainly can be done, and I think it will be done. I'm more optimistic now that we have a transition period, which a lot of people have called for, and I think was essential. Mm. Alighted immediately you have on, on the transition period. Doesn't the notion of a transition period mean that what we are looking at is a total fudge? Because in essence, the British government has agreed that it will still play by the EU's rules for a number of years, maybe two, maybe more, after 20, March 2019. I'm a by training a doctor of medicine, I'm an evolutionist, and I think that when you look at the evidence, people needed more time to adjust. If we had planned for it properly, if there had been a government evaluation of what leaving the EU meant, done by David Cameron's government, and we had got in place plans, well, then it could all have been done much quicker. But once it became clear that the cupboard was completely bare, and that Cameron wasn't even staying on as Prime Minister, as he told us we are going to. It was bound to take more time. But, but I don't think we should uh, expect to be anything other than basically out now by December 2020. We'll be out of the EU in March 2000, uh, 19, nine, in 2019 mm. and out completely, I think, from the uh, arrangement. But we'll be still Europeans. We're going to be uh, traders in Europe as we have been for centuries. The emphasis of our exporting effort will shift, but it's already been shifting. We've been moving out of Europe for exports and more towards foreign markets over the last 20 years. Well, that we'll, we'll talk about that. Trade and the wider sort of diplomatic uh, field in which Britain will play post-Brexit. But just to stick with the process for a second, you, you've written a lot about it and you've said, and I'm quoting you directly here, that Brexit is ne never was and cannot be an easy decision. It's got to be fulfilled by a united UK. Only a united country will get a good deal from the EU. But it is quite transparently obvious that the UK is not united. Even the British cabinet isn't united on what represents a good deal for Britain. I think they're coming to a better position of united. It would have been better if they were more united uh, at various stages. But uh, this issue of Europe has been splitting political parties ever since I first became a candidate for the Labour Party in 1962 when this issue was raised. We've only had two referendums, uh, quite exceptional, and that's because the Labour Party was split massively in 1975 and had a referendum, and because the Conservative Party was split massively that we had this uh, recent uh, referendum. And uh, MPs show by the day how difficult they are uh, having, some of them, in facing up to reality. If you choose a referendum, and after all, they voted for the referendum, they put it through, you abdicate from the decision. You've passed it over to the people of the country. They can, of course, get involved in the negotiation strategy and some elements, but even they are very constrained. It's an international negotiation between 27 countries and ourselves. It's not even really a negotiation. They will come forward with a framework, and we have to say yes or no. But two points. One, the 
referendum clearly was advisory. That, that was the nature of it. And, and, and second of all, it's a snapshot at a particular moment. And the argument today from many people in the Conservative Party who are pro-Remain, in the Labour Party who are pro-Remain, and independent observers too, is there's a feeling that if British public opinion were to fundamentally shift during the course of 2018, then there would be legitimate grounds for a second vote. Do you no, I don't believe that? I don't believe there would be. I must say, I think that when your government sends out a message paid for by the taxpayer to every individual and says this is your decision and we will abide by your decision, I personally think the country has to abide by it. As a Democrat, doesn't it worry you that YouGov, which has been tracking opinion ever since that mm. June referendum, has found in many recent months a very consistent feeling now amongst the British public, a majority who say they would prefer Britain to remain, not leave? Well, there's very many different polls on that, but I'm not going into the polls. I don't enter into, personally, the argument about the referendum. That decision has been taken by the people. There's a legitimate argument about how we negotiate and what position we adopt, but I think that the decision is taken, and it's the result of a long change. So remember, you know, this has been dividing, as I say, this country since 62. Hugh Gates, who was leader of the Labour Party, warned about a federal Europe, and I supported him. I'm against this, not on the trade issue so much as being the fundamental one that I think this country should be a self-governing country. Let's just talk constitutionalism for a moment. You, you sit in the House of Lords. Now, the, the, the with EU withdrawal bill is currently going through the Commons. It looks as though Theresa May has cobbled together uh, a, a, a deal, a legislative deal which is acceptable to a majority in the Commons. It will go to the Lords and there is a strong possibility that that there isn't a majority to back that bill in the Lords, and the Tory party is said by some to be even considering a, 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 a slew of pro-Brexit new peers to ensure a majority in the Lords. How would you feel about uh, that? The House of Commons has absolutely no legitimacy at all in blocking a referendum. I mean the House of Lords? The House of Lords, no. It's the House of Commons has sent it to the uh, upper house, we are a revising chamber. We can make sensible suggestions and on legal issues. And there's some very complicated legal questions about this bill, which is inevitable, actually. But they ought to be weighed and considered. Uh, but in the end of the day, the House of Commons has to determine the issue. And they have to be very aware, more than they are at the moment, of the will of the people. You know, I, as I say, this issue has been with us for a very long time. When in 75 there was a decisive vote, it was accepted basically for about four years. Then people came back to it. Uh, this time, I think it will has surprised the people who were passionate. I supported Europe for many years. Indeed, I, you, you, I you've only made a complete U-turn. I, no, I didn't, if I may say so. I only changed, I, I didn't even change my position. I opposed the Eurozone. I don't believe you can run a currency from 27 old countries, potentially. I did not believe in a federal Europe and never did. And as Foreign Secretary, I put to Cabinet for an all-day meeting a paper which designed to show that you could be in Europe without it becoming a federal Europe. Now, with President Macron, very, very determined to have a federal Europe, good luck to him. And if he and Germany put their act together, it is possible to see at least the Eurozone countries, probably a reduced number, being effectively a United States of Europe. And we'll have good relationship with well, them. Well, let's talk about how it's going to work. You, you've written a book, Britain's Foreign Policy After Brexit. You've written lots I wrote of... it with a person who's 25 years younger than me who oh. voted Remain. <laughs> okay. And I think this does show you can bridge the gaps. <laughs> yeah, but well, let's unpick the thoughts behind the book and see if they make sense today. You, you said, this isn't in the book, I don't think, but it's something you said before the referendum itself, which is stuck in my mind. We will rediscover, you said, the skills of blue water diplomacy and rise to the challenge of global markets. It could be the spark we need to re-energise Britain. Is it a challenge and an opportunity? It's stirring stuff. But what on earth is it? What is this blue water diplomacy you speak of? 
Well, we've done it before. We used to have a navy that operated worldwide. We came out of East of Suez. We're not the Britain of Lord Palmerston no, anymore, No, we, of course we? not. Uh, we're not gunboat diplomacy. It's a more modest uh, navy. We've only got to look at its size. But it is capable, in my view, of these two new aircraft carriers. I don't see them plowing up and down the South China Seas taking on China. But I do think that we have wanted and have needed for the UN a naval rapid reaction force for many, well, many years. And I think this could be a lead role for Britain, but with Commonwealth partners, Commonwealth navies. Let's not begin, though, with this notion of Britain rising to the challenge of, of global markets with a focus on the military, because it seems to me much more important is trade. I agree. Well, the, our history is one of being merchant adventurers. We've been prepared to go and open up new markets in the past. I mean, I don't think... But, I mean, you make it sound like a Rudyard Kipling novel, all no, of this. No, the, the reality no, is something really quite different. I mean, look, look, look I, at where I suspect Britain's you don't know, and probably your readers, uh, your viewers don't know. I was in business. I've never taken a penny piece from the government. When I left the House of Commons, I left it. I was in business in the UK, in textiles, in Russia, with steel and oil, and in America with the pharmaceutical industry. I'm not talking completely out with no knowledge of what it rates to no, be chairman uh, of a company uh, or what uh, takes to export. And, and fair point, but I wonder whether you're reading what those outside Britain looking in are saying, and particularly potentially key trading partners who the British government says well, they're going to reach out to, they're going to strike deals with. This is what they're actually saying. For example, China, Beijing's state-run Global Times, when Philip Hammond, the Chancellor, went there just before Christmas on a trade mission, they said in the Global Times, quote, uncertainty over the UK's future positioning in global trade and financial markets will inevitably have affected the investment and cooperation plans of Chinese companies in the UK. India, the High Commissioner, no less, uh, of India in the UK, has said that Britain will have to accept higher levels of immigration from India if it has any hope of signing a free trade deal with India after Brexit. This but is the reality. If they, if they are skilled people coming to fill jobs in high quality areas of expertise, and India has great knowledge in terms of computers and modern science, we should welcome them. But and, although, so, and you know that most people, well, I wouldn't presume to know what they really felt, but a lot of people, it seems, who voted Brexit, voted on grounds that it would reduce immigration, period. What they, what they didn't want was unlimited immigration from 27 other EU countries which they had no capacity to limit or control. We will have to have immigration laws now answerable to Parliament, but this is not a closed door. We are not closing ourselves to people who can help our economy, help our National Health Service, help science, and also to students. And so we've got to be very much uh, aware of the balance. And immigration has provided great strengths to this country. And I don't know of anybody, and, serious uh, Brexiteer, who believes that we're going to suddenly stop all immigration. We've got to moderate it. It grew out of control, particularly where it was concentrated the, in parts of the country where there wasn't enough in the health service, enough in the education. And if you would address my point about China, in the words of Professor S Steve Tsang, who's a China expert at, at SOAS here in London, he says, Britain has diminished and isolated itself in the eyes of the Chinese as a result of Brexit? Well, I don't agree with that. Uh, I know it's sometimes said by these experts, but I've watched little articles about it. Just recently, I think it was in The Telegraph, a small company in Hastings deciding to move from 90% into European trading to move into China, took an area of high quality electronic lighting equipment and is now selling into chain hotels and doing extremely well but in with China. With respect, we could have done that in the EU. Germany's trade well, relationship with China far outstrips exactly, ours. Exactly. We because they're actually just very good yes. at exporting stuff. Well, they've always and been. And we are very, not. And I well, don't see how Brexit's going to improve that. Why do you take on yourself to say we are not? What do you know well, about I just, this I'm issue? relative to Germany. Our Why export do we performance... spend our whole time doing ourselves down? Why do we have day after day newspaper stories and aimed at demoralising, aimed at sharpening against it? Who are these people who can't take defeat in a referendum, who spend their whole time on this issue? There is a positive story. We are a great country still. We have a great deal of courage, enterprise and energy in our young people. I know a lot of 
of them would have wished to stay. But what I like to see about those younger people, they are much more, in my view, turning their hand to the challenge in but front of us. But would you call the, the IMF and the, well, the CBI IMF, well, yeah, and the Bank of England, are well, these all part of this well, sort all, of doom-mongering all, conspiracy? All, all, all three of the people you mentioned, well, they're profits institutions, of, they're not yes, individuals. Well, profits of they're doom, very important. Well, profits of doom before the referendum result, those exact predictions have not been fulfilled. And we're now, now joint bottom of the G7 well, growth league. You come to, we've had a devaluation, in part a result of Brexit, but in part, in my view, because we were at an unrealistic exchange rate, our exporters are moving up. I don't really understand why one should spend our whole time questioning the very judgment of the British people who decided they wanted to leave the EU. Is that the role of the elite? Is this the role of some MPs who were not able to win? Or are we prepared well, to live with a result and make a success of it? I think, and I no, really do believe this that, requires... That it's important that, that the, the future be considered very carefully, not just from the point of view of, of the politics of Brexit, but from what those outside of the UK are actually saying and thinking about Britain's future relationship with their own countries. What Let me you, just... What you, read finish... out, what you read out from mm. what I'd said was it's a challenge. I don't deny it's a challenge. I don't deny, like most decisions, and what about the Americans? there are downsides. What, what do you think the Americans are going to make of a UK post-Brexit? Just to quote to you a couple of well, important a lot of British voices. Coming... Ben, a sen senior Democrat senator, Ben Cardin, oh. said recently... Germany, post-Britain leaving the EU, Germany will become even more dominant in the EU. And he's looking to the EU first, not to an independent UK. Well, uh, Germany is already the dominant partner in the EU. It's the strongest country. But uh, I believe that Britain will become a very important uh, major contributor to NATO, which will be welcomed by many Americans. After all, it wasn't just uh, President Trump, it was President Obama who told us we were freeloading, we in Europe, on NATO. You, you speak with a, a perspective full of fascinating experience. A former Labour Party foreign secretary who decided to leave Labour, you found it too left-wing, too socialist, you wanted to create a new centre-ground political movement, the Social Democratic Party, for a while. It was extraordinarily popular, but ultimately it was a failed attempt to break the mould of British politics. Here we sit today with a, a really avowedly socialist, leftist Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, who says that he now represents the new centre-ground in British politics. He says he is on the cusp of an historic victory for socialism and the left in the United Kingdom. First of all, do you think that is true? I don't think we can tell. I think that Labour got many votes, uh, many, many votes in the north of England from people who wanted to leave the European Union. And I think that Labour should focus itself on getting a good result to leaving the European Union. And I think all of us should. It, it seems the clear party now, Labour's politics... policy is to say, yes, we are going to leave, we want to leave, but we want to stay, if possible, inside the customs union, maybe inside the single market as well. And if that isn't possible, we want the closest relationship possible and the softest Brexit possible. Well, I want the closest relations possible, but it's not possible to have control over the immigration from EU countries into this country and stay in the single market and in the customs union. This has been made crystal apparent. And you've only got to see what President Macron only just recently criticised the EU for giving as much to David Cameron in his deal. He called it blackmail. Now, he definitely wouldn't give us a better deal than was offered to David Cameron, well, you, and you, that you, wasn't sufficient. You, you, so I think the you've world is your changing. view of Corbyn in terms of Brexit, and it is very important, but let's just leave Brexit aside for a moment. I mean, well, if well you... let me deal. I didn't answer your question on Corbyn, and I will answer your question on Corbyn. I think that he has got quite a lot running for himself and his party, and good luck to him. I think it is a very remarkable achievement to have Labour, young people... Sorry to interrupt, it's rude of me, but if no. you were in Labour today... Uh, a senior figure in the Labour Party, would you feel able to serve under Jeremy Corbyn or would you walk away? I gave money to the Labour Party at the last election. I'm a supporter but not a member. I'm not a member because I don't agree with quite a lot of its economic policy. But I do think that they have shown greater strength. I personally think Labour is 
more right than not on the health service and I believe this government is literally destroyed the health service in England fortunately not yet in Scotland Wales or in Northern Ireland so I am still a social democrat I've never made any secret of this I've never been a Tory and I never will be a Tory but on this issue at the moment let me focus I do believe the issue for this country over 2018, and I agree with you, this is the moment where the toughest decisions are going to be taken over Brexit, that we should rally as a country, we should spend our time on getting the best deal, that party politics will, should slip away into its normal place and not elevate. There'll be time of an election. It might be uh, 2019, might be 2020, might even go to 2021. By that time, Labour has the opportunity to present itself even more successfully than it did at the last election, which it didn't win. I hope they will. I am not one who's going to spend my whole time telling you that Mr Corbyn will never be Prime Minister. I think he might well be. Well, with respect, I did look at your past prognoses of Jeremy Corbyn. You said you didn't think he would even lead Labour into the last election. You said he's a decent person, but I think he'll have to stand down before the next election, which you said, you know, before the, yes, I the did. June 2017 I election. I did, and I, a lot of people... But I think I did also say don't create a new party. The SDP was a, a great attempt... It's a truth that Jeremy Corbyn has shown more sensitivity to his critics from the right than Michael Foote ever showed but I in 1981. I mean, I, I associate you so much with the fight within Labour against so-called militant and the left-leaning groups within the party in the late 70s and early 80s. You walked away, you were described as a traitor by so many in the Labour Party. Well, let's and, say and now, Corbyn, who has an agenda of nationalisation, of out-and-out -out socialism, because he's very proud to be a socialist, you're saying, you know what, I can sign up to that, I can even give money to it. Well, I think the last act of the Labour government under Gordon Brown that was a sort of sensible one was, in fact, to nationalise part of the railways when it uh, showed that it had collapsed. And I don't think we should Isn't be against... Isn't a second the... David Owen U-turn, then? You, uh, may, oh, no. well, you don't like the phrase, but it, you've changed position on Europe from being pro being in the EU to very much being out of it. And, and in terms of socialism and, and, and a pure left-wing ideology, I you, never, you I rebelled never against it and now you're for I never it. joined the Liberal party I've stayed a social democrat all this time I told you I don't think that currently Labour Party is a social democratic party that's why I've not joined it but I am of the left I am passionately a believer in the National Health Service I believe that the creation of that in 1948 was a great day of freedom my father was a GP he rejoiced the fact you're that he didn't, you're a he didn't have too. to pay he didn't have to ask his patients to pay so I'm on social policy I have always been on the left but I was when I was leader of the SDP and even before. I believe that we did have to change trade union laws. I believe that we did have to change the economy. And above all, I wanted strong defence. But, but all I of may... those were challenged by Michael Foote in 1981 to 83. And it took 81 from the time we left till 97 before Labour won. But if I, I think may... that Corbyn is getting closer to it. And as I said to you, he has attracted young people. He's got an increased membership. You can't take this away from him. If you had your time over again, would you now think differently about leaving the Labour Party? Would you have stayed in? Well, you study these things. You know perfectly well I was totally opposed to the new SDP linking up with the Liberal Party within weeks and months of joining. I thought that was a great mistake. We were a new party and we should have stood our own ground. And I didn't expect when I joined the SDP and helped to make it a success that I would spend a lot of time arguing, are you or are you not a Liberal? I was not a Liberal. I remain a Social Democrat. And that means I have to give the Labour Party my uh, help where I can, my criticism where I think it's just. But overall, I am on the left in British politics, and I have never shifted that position. Lord Owen, we have to end there, but thank you very much for being Pleasure. on Hard Talk. Thank you. Thank you very much.